So I got to 300 subscribers and I thought I'd make a small uh, assumptions video, you know, what do my friends assume about me? Because it's a weird thing, isn't it, that in an online community you often have like, because the mediating institution is itself anonymity, it's the internet, I think we often know less about each other than we, we would in other circumstances where we share a lot of life and hobby together. Uh, so I asked some friends what they assumed about me and I thought I'd make a short assumptions video uh, about to kind of celebrate my 300th subscriber whoever you were I guess I'm now on the march to 400 we'll see if I ever get there uh, when I get there I think I might do something like a giveaway um, I'm obviously thank you for following and I hope you enjoy what I make so uh, there are a lot of Tom Bombadil themed questions here um, <laughs> we'll see uh, about those but we'll start with Andrew I'm going to link all the people who replied I think have chat channels and I'll link them in the comments and I recommend all of them I follow all of them but yeah here's Andrew from Andrew's Wizardly Reads Assumptions I assume you do fascinating voices when you DM your uh, you know when your your NPCs are in your role-playing games I, I don't know I don't doubt they're fascinating I do try to differentiate I think it's like well I wouldn't pretend I've got a, like a great voice talent but I do try to differentiate so there's... Because I think in such a fundamentally aural game um, as a storytelling game like D&D, &D, I think you've got to put something in there. I don't do accents. I don't do uh, kind of really explicitly crazy accent uh, voices either. But I do try to differentiate. If your players start acting like murder hobos, you perform a TPK. I think I would. I think that there is a really important principle, which is it, or a really important idea... I think that players generally misbehave in games when the game isn't working as they might think or if it's not responsive to their cues. Um, and so I think Murder Hobo play, and by that I mean players who are actively destructive, who seem to basically hate the stuff that's in the world and like, how oh, would it be funny if we killed everyone? As opposed to just players who don't act morally. Um, I think players act destructively because the, the world isn't responsive to their cues. And so I think you avoid it. Uh, as with all things, as with children's behaviour, <laughs> prevention is better than cure. Um, I think if I, yeah, if players are really difficult, you are entitled as a DM to put um, incentives in the way to change that behaviour. I assume you go into used bookstores and find old books and scream, you belong in a museum and then take it home and put it on your shelf. I haven't been to a used bookstore in a long time. Um, I think maybe I'm not sure if I went in 2021 possibly once certainly I did go in 2019 but beyond that I don't think I've been very often in the last couple of years uh, but yet at one point when I was younger as a teen um, and as in maybe even to my early 20s I was certainly into my early 20s I would often be in used bookstores and buy a lot of secondhand books and particularly earlier on you'd find in like smaller used bookstores you just find crazy stuff for, you know you'd be like it'd be an 1880 copy in hardback of the complete poems of Robert Browning or something for two pounds or three pounds stuff that you know you're like this would go for 15 or 16 or 20 or 30 now comfortably and it's not inflation it's that basically used bookstores have seen that they can sell stuff for that kind of money uh, but yeah I used to uh, definitely be like this this belongs somewhere good I do definitely feel like when I see good books not necessarily old books but good books um, which need a home I definitely think uh, building the library is a worthy place for them to go. I think libraries are legacies we can leave people. I assume your wife is sick of your 52 different versions of The Lord of the Rings. I only have two, I think. Um, I think she's more generally worried about the sheer number of books we have. She likes books a lot. Uh, she reads books a lot. But I think she is worried about the number of books we get and the kind of... It's something where occasionally uh, family members or friends will be like, oh, you've got a big library looking at like one book oh that's lots of books that's great and you're like yeah that is great that is a lot of books we've got more uh, uh they're, they're where we should be sleeping or cooking i guess uh, but yeah that's more my wife's concern i think i assume your favorite modern fantasy is rotes i assume that's realm of the Elderlings by robin hobb so i am really interested in realm of the Elderlings, but i've never read any in terms of modern fantasy um, and i think it is modern fantasy it's from the 90s isn't it i guess some of Megan Lindholm's fiction is from the 80s. I'm really interested in Wizard of the Pigeons. So same author, different pseudonym. I'm going to read Assassin's Apprentice this year and we'll see if I like it. Uh, if I do, I can imagine, I mean, there's what, 12 books. I can imagine I could get into those. Uh, and they're not all super, super long either compared to Tad Williams or whatever. 
I'm going to switch out from Andrew because Andrew put his in one block and I think we've got to deal with some of these Lord of the Rings themed questions we're about to get hit by. I assume one day, this is Liam from Liam's Lyceum. I will link him. He has a very good channel. If you like classic fantasy, he's particularly good. If you haven't already done so, you're going to dig your own Hobbit hole. Um, I am pro-Hobbit, pro-Shire. I'm pro-living above ground. Um, I'm pro-not having terribly hairy feet. So I don't think I'm going to go that far. I also assume your favourite vegetable is carrots. It would be if I could grow them more easily. Uh, I we, we got a we got our first ever reasonable crop of carrots this year, and it still wasn't very big. I think the soil we're, we're farming is too still too heavy and claggy and clay. Uh, as we amend it and improve it over the years, that'll be easier. Uh, but what is my favourite vegetable? I like Brussels sprouts. You need to cook them properly, uh, like sensibly. I like potatoes. We do grow potatoes. They're both those were very good at growing. Parsnips can be pretty good for neeps and tatties and things like that. Oh, what else? What other vegetables do I like? Um, I mean, what was it? Yeah, rhubarb is a vegetable, but it's a dessert vegetable. Uh, probably my favourite. Pro let's be honest, that's probably my favourite uh, vegetable, rhubarb. We grow rhubarb as well. Uh, and it's a good cash crop. If you're looking for things that will save you money by you growing things like rhubarb and soft fruit like um, black current, uh, blackberries and um, raspberries and stuff, strawberries, those are good cash crops to grow that will save you money. Uh, and then Nico pops in with, I assume you think Tom Bombadil serves no purpose in Lord of the Rings. Nico from Nico's Book Reviews, one, the other member of the Wizardly duo along with Andrew, uh, he then adds kidding because, of course, Lord, Lord of the Rings needs Tom Bombadil. In fact, the last thought Frodo has as he leaves Middle-earth is of Tom Bombadil's house. Uh, there, I have a video on Tom Bombadil in the Lord of the Rings on this channel, hence what we're, we're about to suffer together. I assume you walk around wearing a bright blue jacket and yellow boots as an homage to ne Tom Bombadil, says Patrick Ryan. Nico then adds, I assume you're a merry fellow. And then Liam pops back in, I assume Owen Edwards is an alias and you are indeed Tom Bombadil. In fact, I know it to be true, and it's not just an assumption. Uh, Liam, as someone I've actually spoken to, I guess if there's anyone, he then kind of uh, offers as a clarification his videos of proof. I mean, yes, Tom Bombadil, wouldn't it be great if more people were like Tom Bombadil, not um, absorbed into needing or requiring things, uh, with being at one with their world and not needing to control it, uh, treading lightly on the earth and all the rest of it. Uh, but alas, I am not so pure. Uh, Kate, the literary apothecary, I'll link her channel too, and I'll link um, Patrick's. Kate says, I assume you're the most awesomest Owen Edwards around. I don't know, I haven't. we haven't had a meeting in a long time, uh, but I used to get a lot of emails for this one guy who has the kind of .co.uk equivalent of what my email address is, which has part of my name as part of it. Um, and so I get this thing where it's like, Owen, you need to come to a doctor's appointment. Owen, you need to pay a fine. Owen, have you con you've recently registered for this course. Do you want to log in? And I, I always think maybe I should just take this guy's life over. I could run it much better than him, I'm sure. Uh, no, I'm joking. I don't know. Uh, there must be, statistically, there must be awesome Aaron Edwards is around. Uh, Liam returns with, I assume you secretly wish your name was spelt Owen, well, Owen Edwards, but uh, Welsh and Saxon spellings are the two different names. Um, I don't know. I Well, by Welsh, actually, it's Irish, isn't it? It's kind of that um, E-O-G-H-A-N. I can't be having with, uh, you know, given I live in England and uh, <laughs> I've grown up in England, you know, I, for my Irish and Welsh ancestry, I can't, I can't be having with uh, Gaelic spellings. Um, and I'm also not Anglo-Saxon. Those guys, those guys are gone. Uh, we, we, we Latinized them, didn't we, uh, with the Norman conquest. T from an Erudite Adventure. T uh, Tony and Kate have a great channel. You'll enjoy it. He asks, I assume you're nice me because I'm awesome and not because I'm weird. Yeah, Tony, because you're awesome. I also assume you aren't as weird as some of the others around here. This is on the Wizardly Discord duo. I'm pretty sure I'm not as weird as some of those guys. You're right. But uh, I don't know, what, what does weird mean here? I'm not trying to be trendy, but if weird means on a watch list somewhere, well, probably most of us are on a watch list somewhere, aren't we? Um, if you mean um, eccentric, probably I count as eccentric, uh, statistically. I assume you're way more busy than it seems, but making YouTube vids is super relaxing for you. YouTube, making YouTube videos is generally easy. I try to keep it easy if I can. Uh, I try to do one shot via Bandicam. That uploads straight away. Uh, it's why my videos are low tech and not very good, but it's relaxing and I like talking to people about them afterwards. Um, I am busy. Uh, I'm sure we all are, aren't we? But uh, I have lots of different responsibilities. 
Uh, but YouTube is a fun diversion. You're right. I assume that, like any sane person, you think dragons are best when they are massive. Yeah, I do. But, I, you know, Bahamut the Platinum Dragon, he's pretty big, isn't he? The one exception is Swamp Dragons in Discworld. You know, they are enjoyably small. And there's a, a fun commentary on the kind of meeting. Partly because Swamp Dragons are also ridiculous in practical terms. They are not the scientific version of a dragon. Or if there really was a dragon, it'd be silly. But they are the kind of the, a, a another version of kind of what would happen in a fantasy world if you had a dragon that actually attempted to process flame and would there be any use and when would they be useful i think it's a really interesting uh, use of the trope uh, patrick i assume your favorite number is 12 probably seven 12 pretty good though i say this i think base 12 is a really useful base uh, it's the un one of the, an underrated defense of the imperial or customary measurement system popular in america somewhat used in england still britain uh, in general is based on well base 12 14 16 uh, depending on the particular measurement and base 12 and, uh, and and 16 are both very useful bases for mathematical operations so yes i like 12. i assume that if you came to a fork in the road you'd prefer to go to the right uh, are they identical forks i feel like that's very hard to answer it does the right hand fork obviously head into lava uh, I don't think you're giving me the information I need, Patrick. Uh, we'll return to Andrew now for the second half of his questions. I assume your favourite classic fantasy artist is Daryl K. Sweet. Uh, Wheel of Time, Chronicles of Thomas Covenant, The Unbeliever. I really like Daryl K. Sweet. I like classic fantasy covers in one way. I think it's something where I probably, uh, in most ways, honestly, get on better with minimalistic modern styles. But I do like the, particularly the kind of 50s paperbacks and stuff where I've got with, with kind of ridiculous cover images. Uh, but Daryl K. Sweet, I think, is a good exemplar. I'm trying to think there's a really great guy for historical paintings uh, of war who's very similar in terms of how I feel about him. But yeah, Daryl K. Sweet, pretty good. If I, maybe I prefer Alan Lee or John Howe, maybe I prefer. Um, who was I thinking? Classic. I see classic as before 1990, really. Um, maybe Josh Kirby of the Discworld. Uh, he then asks, Andrew asks, I assume you prefer the Alan Lee Lord of the Rings illustrated edition. I don't own the illustrated editions. Feel free to send them to me. I assume you prefer Terry Pratchett over Neil Gaiman. It then, because this is copied off a Discord, adds edited. Like edited Neil Gaiman? Uh, Terry Pratchett or Neil Gaiman? Yes, Terry Pratchett. I really like Neil Gaiman. I recommend him. I think, and I, the Sandman is, maybe this is a, a useful thing to say, probably Neil Gaiman's best work was what brought him to public attention, i.e. the Sandman, whereas Terry Pratchett's, Ta Pratchett's best novels came 20 years after his adult fantasy career started, 30 years after his first book. Um, there is something where Gaiman has, is always good, always fun, but I'm not sure if he always transcends some of the uh, limitations of his style whereas I think Pratchett uh, is a writer of kind of the absolute first class um, and will go down very well in history. I like Neil Gaiman a lot though. I assume your D&D campaign has been going constantly for the last three, 10 years. It hasn't but I um, my campaigns overall net at least 10 years I have two I guess I've got like a, a four or five year old campaign a three and a half year old campaign, a three year old campaign, and then I've got some shorter ones. So altogether, because I, I run a lot of D&D, &D, uh, my main hobby apart from, I guess, playing softball um, with with my friends over the summer and the kids, because the kids love it. Uh, but yeah, uh, my net is a lot, uh, a lot, and long campaigns. If you can get past the first, like the fifth session, I think is the cliche. If you can get past the fifth session, it can last a long time because by that point you generally have players who want to turn up to the next one and um, because i've been lucky enough to have that a few times um i have those long running campaigns andrew then promises i will think of more later at o n e um and uh, he didn't he lied so we will don't follow his channel and uh, don't patronize any of his videos apart from uh, to tell him off but uh, I will probably do another one of these videos another time. Andrew can redeem himself at that point with more assumptions. And if you've got assumptions you are interested in knowing about, put them in the comments for next time. Maybe 500, maybe 600. 
subscribers that might well take another year or two so <laughs> we may never get there uh, but yes i hope you enjoyed this as i say thank you for following i hope you enjoy what i do till next time